a continuation of chapter one, discovering the origin and purpose of man, an act of treason. Perhaps the greatest crime committed in any kingdom or nation, ancient or modern, is the crime of treason. As a matter of fact, it is the only crime to which there is no question of receiving the death penalty. It is the ultimate act of betrayal. When a government confers on any citizen the authority and right to represent its interest, it has given the greatest form of trust possible and should be esteemed as the highest of honors. The higher the representation, the greater the responsibility and trust, and thus the greater the influence one can have in one's nation or kingdom. This is especially critical in the context of kingdoms where the king not only represents himself but embodies and symbolizes the entire kingdom and all it constitutes. Adam, in essence, embodied heaven's government on earth. Therefore, the fall of man was not just a personal act of disobedience but was essentially an act of treason. Adam and his descendants committed the ultimate act of betrayal, deserving the penalty of death. In effect, Adam declared independence from his kingdom government, the empire of heaven, and in so doing, severed his relationship with the king of heaven, abandoned his position as ambassador, and lost his dominion over earth. Through abdication of his responsibility as king over earth, Adam lost the most important relationship of all, the Holy Spirit. Through violation of God's word, mankind was rendered a disqualified representative of heaven on earth. When Adam fell through this act of treason, he did not only lose his personal relationship with his heavenly father, but he lost a kingdom. Adam became an ambassador without portfolio, an envoy without official status, a citizen without a country, a king without a kingdom, a ruler without a domain. A kingdom promised. In understanding kingdoms and the concept of colonization, the success of colonization depends on the direct and uninterrupted relationship with and the submission of the colony to the imperial kingdom. The loss of the kingdom of heaven on earth was considered rebellion against the eternal imperial kingdom of heaven and the creating of a vagabond state. Earth became a territory under an illegal government while Adam committed high treason the instigator and adversary, the evil one, executed an earthly coup. Remember, Adam did not lose heaven when he fell. Rather, he lost earth and did not lose. Rather, he lost earth and dominion over earth. He lost legal representation of heaven on earth. Adam defected. This is what God meant when he said in Genesis 2, 17, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. This death was not referring primarily to physical death, though that would be the ultimate result, but rather to man's spiritual disconnection from his source and kingdom. This is evidenced by the fact that Adam lived 930 years after the act of disobedience. Therefore, death to the Creator was disconnection and independence from God and the kingdom of heaven. Adam lost the kingdom. The consequences of this rebellion were numerous. Loss of position and disposition, transfer of responsibility, self-consciousness and shame, fear and intimidation of authority, the loss of domination over nature, frustrated toil and hatred of labor, 
pain and discomfort and the need for human, for human accountability. However, God's most significant response to this defection and treacherous act was his promise to the adversary recorded in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The heart of this promise is the coming of an offspring through a woman who would break the power of the adversary over mankind and regain the authority and dominion Adam once held, and through a process of conflict, restore the kingdom back to mankind. This was the first promise of a Messiah King and the return of the kingdom. Therefore, the greatest need of man was identified by what he lost. He did not lose a religion or heaven but rather a kingdom. In God's restoration and redemptive program, heaven would not be his primary focus or goal for man, but rather the redemption, restoration, and reestablishment of his kingdom on earth. This would be the principal purpose and assignment of the promised Messiah. Ever since this tragic cosmic calamity of man's rebellion against his heavenly kingdom government, religion has been his vain attempt to return to God's presence or to compensate for the loss. Therefore, religion represents every activity of mankind in its self-centered search for God and the kingdom, whether through Scientology, Baha'i, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Animism, Eutarianism, Atheism, or any other ism or philosophy. The principal motivation is to rediscover and receive what he lost, the kingdom of God. No matter what name they bear, all religions are an exercise in futility because they express man's vain, frustrating pursuit to recover what he lost. Humanity faced an insoluble dilemma. No matter how hard we tried, we could never find an infinite God by using finite human resources called religion. Fortunately for us, God solved the problem himself because he is the only one who could. Mankind's problem did not take God by surprise. In his omniscience, his all-knowing nature, God knew before time began that we would never find him without his help. Therefore, God launched a journey he set out to find us. God is the chaser and we are the pursued. Instead of allowing us to expend our lives in continual frustration, trying to reach up and touch him, he came down to take hold of us. His desire and purpose were to bring us back into relationship with himself and return us to the lost kingdom. Religion, therefore, is simply man's search for God. No matter how committed, dedicated, loyal, faithful, zealous, active, or complex our religious pursuit may be, as long as man is still searching, dissatisfied, and desirous for more, he has not yet found the kingdom. He's like a fish out of water. No matter what he does, there's only one solution to his problem. This emptiness cannot be substituted with oil, gasoline, orange juice, milk, or alcohol. Religion is man's substitute for the kingdom, and that is why it, can, it cannot and will never satisfy him. Only the kingdom can solve man's eternal problem. I personally understand the frustration of religion. 
I know what it is to grow up in religion, just like the Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and all the others. I understand the dedication, loyalty, and daily preoccupation with the rituals, traditions, forms, and activities of religious behavior. From a child, I was cultured to embrace religion and not question why we did what we were told or commanded to do. It has become plain to me now that religion preoccupies you in order to distract you. To distract you from your hunger and emptiness for the kingdom. In essence, religion is designed to keep you too busy to fill your assignment for the kingdom. Perhaps this is why religion has so many activities related to it. Religion is hard work and its work is its reward. Perhaps with this understanding, now the words of Jesus Christ can be understood. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be will be filled. Matthew 5, 3 through 6. In his first official presentation of his message to mankind over 2,000 years ago, Jesus unveiled and announced the problem and solution for mankind's dilemma in these simple statements. He identified the truth that all humanity is spiritually poor, which means that they have a natural lack and an inherent need. He declared that the solution is not a religion, but the kingdom. He further recognized that the whole family of mankind is in perpetual mourning as if something died or was lost. And he saw the coming of the kingdom as the comfort to this mourning. His reference to the hunger of all mankind for righteousness was simply a recognition that their right relationship and right positioning with the authority or, or government is guaranteed to be satisfied by the kingdom. One day, I sat on a stone bench in Israel, right outside the famous Church of the Resurrection in Jerusalem, and observed thousands of Christian pilgrims, cameras in hand, eyes filled with excitement, file into this lavishly decorated building. I had just left the place of the Temple Mount where I observed scores of Muslim pilgrims kneeling on the concrete floor of the terrace, some washing their bodies in ritual fashion at the holy water taps around the mosque. Just below was a scene right out of history as thousands of Jewish pilgrims and worshipers rocked back and forth with such fervor that it looked painful. As I watched with interest these very beautiful activities, I could not but wonder, could this be what a loving God of creation enjoys? It looked like hard work and labor. Everyone seemed to be so pressured to please some deity with the zeal of a possessed spirit. Can this really be what God desires? Suddenly, while pondering these thoughts deep within my soul, I heard the following words echoing loudly in my head. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty. 30. These simple words changed my life again for they fully described what I was seeing with my eyes. Religion is hard work. We will never rest until we find the kingdom 
Religion is the toil of mankind in his search for the kingdom. God's original plan for man. To understand the past and future of man and to appreciate the present state of man's journey through time, it is crucial to consider God's original purpose and plan for his creation. God's purpose in the beginning was to establish a family of spirit sons, not servants, establish a kingdom, not a religious organization, establish a kingdom of kings, not subjects, establish a commonwealth of citizens, not religious members, establish relationship with man, not a religion, extend his heavenly government to earth and influence earth from heaven through mankind. Sons or servants. Being brought up in the Bahamas in the Caribbean, a former colony of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, I understand the implications of the word servant and the clear distinction between a servant and a son. Under the colonial system and a product of former slaves, the role of segregation, discrimination, and prejudice had detrimental influences on my life. The obstacles were evident and manifested themselves in graphic ways that clearly placed us at a disadvantage when it came to benefits and privileges in the kingdom. As servants of the crown, we were not allowed to share the same opportunities in education, work, leisure, financial prosperity, and status in society. This inequity was contrasted by the seemingly unlimited fortunate lifestyles of the sons of the masters in the kingdom. A servant is definitely not the same as a son. A closer look at God's original plan will reveal how great a divide exists between religion and relationship. God originally intended to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth through mankind. In this plan, God's purpose was to establish a family of sons, not a household of servants. Just as scripture shows us that man, that men are Christ's bride, so too are women God's sons. In Christ, we are all heirs. See Romans 8, 14. In the eighth chapter of John, Jesus makes a clear distinction between servants and sons. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. John eight thirty one through 36 Jesus said that sons are members of the family, but servants are not. From the beginning, God wanted offspring who would relate to him in love, not slaves or hired servants who would obey him out of obligation. Servants may relate to their master on a superficial level, but no intimacy or sense of family exists. Sons, on the other hand, are part of the family. They are heirs who will inherit everything that belongs to their father. Sons, not subjects. God's purpose was to establish a kingdom of sons, not subjects. This is a difficult concept for us to understand at first because from the human perspective, the existence of a king automatically implies the existence of subjects. Subjects are people who are subject to the king's rule and are never considered in the same class or status as royalty. However, this is not God's plan for us. 
God is indeed a king, but he does not want subjects. He wants sons. He does not want to rule us, but to have a family who shares his rulership. God's kingdom is different from earthly kingdoms in that it has no subjects. There are no peasants in the kingdom of God, only sons. In the kingdom of God, we are not subjects, but members of the royal family. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, whom Revelation 19.16 refers to as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is our elder brother. Everyone in God's kingdom is a prince or princess. There are no peasants or middle class and no order of servants. In God's kingdom, everyone is related to the king. Citizens, not religious members. In addition, God's purpose was to establish a commonwealth of citizens, not members of a religion. This understanding is essential to grasping the concept of the message of Jesus Christ concerning the kingdom of heaven. As a kingdom is a government and nation, it would not have members as would a religious organization. As a matter of fact, the Lord never intended that those who believe in Jesus as Messiah and King be referred to as Christians. Now, you are probably stumbling over this sentence and wondering how I could make such a statement. Here's the problem. The word Christian has too much baggage attached to it. It refers to a whole host of people and some of them have no connection to God's kingdom. The word has become a religious term devoid of any significant meaning as it relates to the kingdom of God. Kingdoms are built upon the concept of legalities, which extends to its citizens, offering them the rights and privileges that are guaranteed by the king. People who adhere to some religion group, including Christians, consider themselves members of the group, which they perceive as a religious and spiritual relationship with the organization or fraternity. For instance, the term Christian refers to an individual who adheres to or sympathizes with the Christian faith and is identified both inside and outside that faith as a religious entity. However, the concept of kingdom is completely opposite to the, the concept of religion. Once again, the concept of kingdom is completely opposite to the concept of religion. A kingdom consists of a king with citizens. Citizenship is essentially a legal entity with rights and privileges protected by a constitutional commitment of the king and his government. Too many Christians are simply religious people, but citizens of the kingdom are legal people. Legal in the sense that by virtue of a spiritual birth, each individual in the kingdom has the rights and blessings of citizens of this heavenly kingdom. We must be delivered from our religious mindsets and have our thinking readjusted so that we can take on a regal mindset. Religious people have no rights, but legal people do. God has always desired sons who are citizens of his kingdom, possessing the legal right to be part of his family. Citizenship is always considered a privilege in all kingdoms and nations and is usually reserved for those born into that nation or kingdom. There are special situations where one can become a citizen through privileges extended by the governing authority, but birthright is the guaranteed form of sonship and the resulting rights of citizenship. In Jesus, these precious rights are conferred to everyone who trusts him, trust in him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, 
but born of God. John 1, 12 through 13. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. The name Christian was originally a derogatory label given by pagans to followers of Christ. Even though believers through the centuries have generally accepted the term, which literally means little Christ, and born it with honor. Yet the term Christian recurs only twice in the scriptures, see Acts 26, 28 through 29, and 1 Peter 4, 16 through 17. Please let me stress that I am not denying the value or the role this identification has played in the life or the history of the Christian religion over the past 2,000 years. But my concern is the restrictive religious connotations that have distracted many people from the original purpose, message, and mission of the kingdom of God. The term Christian tends to mentally lock a person into a religious mold and limits the reality of the truth about the kingdom. The Bible refers to a man's relationship to God with these phrases, servants, which is another word for representative minister as a government minister, saints, ambassadors, sons of God, citizens of heaven, kings, God's workmanship, children of God, and other terms of endearment, but not officially are they referred to as Christians. Christianity was never a term given to us by Jesus Christ nor the apostles. The term Christian was never to be a title nor a label that we wore, but a lifestyle that we lived demonstrating the nature of Christ's likeness. In essence, Christian was supposed to be a description of the culture of the kingdom being exhibited through our lives. This is why the first believers were called Christians by the early observers of their lifestyle, their power, their boldness, and their Christ-like authority. Right or wrong, most unbelievers have a definite idea of what they think a Christian should be. If we are not careful, we can identify too strongly with their label and fall into the trap of trying to live up to their expectations. We should stop trying so hard to live like Christians and all of the false assumptions associated with that term and instead work harder at living like sons and daughters of God brothers and sisters of Christ, and citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Relationship or religion. Finally, God's purpose was to establish relationship, not religion. As stated earlier, religion is man's search for God and the kingdom he lost. The original plan and purpose of God was to have a family of sons, that he could relate to as a father to his children. This plan was evident from the beginning and is expressed more fully in the earthly introduction of the Father by Jesus Christ himself. A careful review of the principle set forth in the Holy Scripture, which is the constitution of the kingdom, will reveal this constant desire for personal and intimate relationship with fellowship intimate relationship and fellowship that God desired with all mankind. All of his actions throughout history were extensions of himself to us as he desired to tabernacle or dwell with man. His ultimate goal was always to restore his original place with mankind. How much more personal can one get? This is the truth behind Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, where a young man took his inheritance early, left home, and wasted his fortune in ungodly living. 
later on destitute and hungry and reduced to feeding pigs in a sty, he decided to return home, hoping to be received by his father simply as a hired servant. Upon his arrival, however, his father greeted him with joy and open arms and restored him to his rightful place in the family. See Luke 15, 11 through 24. The father wanted his son back, not a servant. That's the way God is too. He wants sons, not servants or subjects. He wants citizens, not Christians. And he wants relationships, not religion. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We are going to stop here. You can click here for a continuation of chapter one, or if you haven't subscribed to the channel, you can also do that here. Thank you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.